Hi, I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Prime Vision Network. So today on the Econ Show, we're gonna uh, we're gonna break it out a little bit. We're gonna do a special report on Afghanistan, and then we're gonna do a bit more in uh, in some other areas. But we really wanted to to talk about what's happening in Afghanistan. We've talked about it previously. And we just wanted to give, you know, what went wrong? Why did it go wrong? Where, where, how did we get to this point? Because there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of data flying around. You know, what is real? What isn't real? And I, I think it's important to kind of start, you know, where are we right now? So, so far there's reports coming out that the Taliban are not letting anyone into the Kabul airport which is obviously a problem because you have individuals trying to uh, escape. And it's those that have helped um, allied co coalition forces, you know, U.S. forces as interpreters, as means of communication, because these are the individuals that, be, well, that will be sought after. And, and one thing that I'd just like to say, because, you know, it's... There's a lot of pushback in at times about individuals, about whether they can become citizens or not. You know, for me, these, these, they prove themselves. You know, they, they have nothing left to prove. You know, because when you help a coalition force, you don't risk yourself. You risk yourself and your family. You know, these individuals, uh, you know, the Taliban in terms of revenge won't go and kill that individual. They'll kill the whole family. You know, this is something that we've continued to see time and time again, which is why it's so important to protect those that help us and, and really provide the service. And let's just be fair, give them the, something similar that they gave us, which was protection, which was help. I mean, speak to any military individual and they'll be the first to tell you that the translators, the, the, their guides were just as much a part of the, the unit as anyone else. It's like leaving one of our own soldiers behind for many of them. So again, I know many had their you know, wounds reopened looking at what is happening, but you, know, you, you, you did your job, you went in, you know, Al-Qaeda was pushed out. You know, there's, obviously there was a lot of politics that came along with this in terms of suits versus boots as the saying goes. But we have to look at where do we go from here and really how did we get here? So this is when we look at what is this chart and, and what is it showing? So this is just looking at the ethnic backdrop because I, I think, and a lot in the West like to uh, ignore, there's a big tribal backdrop and we have to understand the, the tribal nature who is allied with who, who hates who for what reason, and is there any means of peace that could possibly happen within different time frames. So when we look at where did we did we come right now? So a veteran uh, Tajik commander who is uh, Mossad was he was the unifier. He created the Northern Alliance, and the Northern Alliance was a uh, was was a mixture of Tajik, uh, Hazir, and Uzbek to create an entity to fight against the Taliban between ninety the Civil War of ninety two to ninety six. So this was an individual who was very powerful, you know, was, a, was an alliance, and actually two days prior to 9-11 was uh, killed by, Al -Qaeda, by two Al-Qaeda suicide bombers. So now his son has essentially picked up the torch and has created a resistance movement where the vice president of Afghanistan has moved to or uh, and, and, and trying to create some sort of resist resistance within the Panjir Valley, which has always been essentially protected from the Taliban. And, it, and the reason why is it's easily fortified because it's a valley. There's a lot of support within that area. And there's a lot of means and communication that can go into Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, as well as northern uh, you know, Pakistan. So when you look at the Taliban, which are Pashtuns, and it's important to, to, to differentiate, Pashtuns make up 42% of Afghanistan and a, a, a decent chunk or about 15% of Afghanistan. Now, just because you're Pashtun doesn't mean you support the Taliban because the Taliban is, a, is a, essentially a an extreme version of Pashtun. And that's when we start getting into Sunni versus Shia because it's very easy to lump people into, oh, they're just Sunni and that's why they're doing this. Well, no, there's very specific sects of Sunni 
And a lot of them can pervert the Quran. They can pervert Sharia law because depending on who you who you uh, essentially follow or what methodology or, or viewpoints you follow as a Sunni, Shari law just also means women can be in the streets with their hair showing, they can have jobs, they can have political office. The, it, it all comes down to what piece of that do you fall under with, as we know, the Taliban falling under a much stricter version, which is, you know, they're trying to soften their image. You know, when you look at the press conferences, they have a charm offensive. And, and again, they're not they're not stupid when it comes to marketing. And, and and that's what we have to remember. There is a marketing aspect behind it. You know, we're here to, we're not gonna let Al Qaeda come in. You know, we learned our lesson. You know, we're we're gonna avoid allowing them to operate within the country. And then it comes back down to did they allow it? You know, we, there's there's reports saying that the Al Qaeda was paying them twenty million dollars a year for their support and just essentially patronage, and then there's other reports saying that the Taliban were so broken up and they were you know in different areas and they they there were areas that were operating semi autonomously, if not fully autonomously, and that was Al Qaeda was, was uh, structured. So again, we'll we'll touch on some of these different pieces, but it's important to understand how broken up Afghanistan is. And and I think that is something that is missed. And when you look at the Taliban or the Pashtun ability to move between the, these uh, these borders, that was when, when the U.S. landed, that was when you had that movement and essentially bleeding into or moving and hiding within the mountain ranges, which then led to our push into some of this tough terrain. Now, what do we also have? We have the winter freeze. So a lot of this was going to have to happen prior to winter, which is why there was such a big push. So when you look at where we are right now, this is the Taliban have have now have most control, except for some contested areas and the Panjshir Valley, <clears throat> where now it's where are the pieces? Who is going to fight with who? Where is there going to be some resistance? And then is there going to be support for that resistance? And we're going to go through some of those different pieces over that time period. But one of the things that we have to remember was there was a deal signed in Doha that essentially said the U.S. would stop its bombings and raids on the Taliban, you know, in good faith saying that, look, we're going to stop this, you stop attacking, and we'll come up with some solution on a government as U.S. forces were removed. And instead, what did we see? We saw the Taliban because it didn't take a lot of U.S. force to provide stability within some of these regions. And not to say that there was always going to be stability because there's rural regions, there's other infighting, but the ability for the U.S. to go out and run sorties and do, you know, black operations in terms of, uh, you know, small attacks kept the Taliban very disorganized. And by giving them over a year to essentially assemble create supply lines and and make deals was really something that I don't think was appreciated by the previous administration nor this administration. And when you look at the intelligence reports starting even eight months ago, it was like, hey guys, like the Taliban is is assembling, like they're gonna make a big push. And as and the other thing is when you look at this border between Pakistan and, and Afghanistan, it is very mountainous. Like you're not just jumping in your Jeep and driving food and water up to the fort. Like that doesn't exist because it's so it's so dense. It's such tough terrain that a lot of this was being conducted through airdrop. So the U.S. and coalition forces told the Afghan military, you need to work out deals with your with the locals within these regions to help you get food and, and, and supplies to these uh, far-flung way uh, uh, areas because this was how we found the effective way of stopping some of these Taliban uh, tal- uh, the, the Taliban um, uh, supply chains. But without the ability to, to refuel, without the ability to, um, to get some of the supplies, a lot of them were abandoned or they turned around and made an, the, the opposite deal. Instead of, make, instead of making deals with the Afghan government, they made deals with the Taliban. And they, they handed over equipment. And this was starting 
way before any of this transpired. So there was a view that there was going to be a fight, but the fight was going to be kept to the fringes and you weren't going to get this collapse down. Now, over the years, the Afghan government has been proven to be you know, corrupt as, as others have been proven to be corrupt. And this left a bad taste in people's mouths. And again, it comes down to freedom under corruption or, you know, something under the Taliban, which, you know, we're still waiting to see what that's going to be. And, and I think that's when you look at how the Taliban moved in, it was very fluid and it came through areas that were mostly Pashtun. So when you look at that backdrop, because remember the president was Pashtun, this is not like the, 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 um, the majority tribe was being, um, you know, diminished in any way. It's just a matter of what was going to be the next steps. So let's just think, think of this as we start going to the different pieces. So when you consider where did we, how did we start? So the Soviets sent troops in uh, 1979 under the USSR Afghan uh, Friendship Treaty, which was signed with the communist Afghan um, government. So that came in 1979, but when, when that happened, many uh, of the individuals fled into Iran and into Pakistan, and given very reasons, so the, uh, the uh, Hazars, they're Shia, so they do, res- uh, they, they, are, uh, they are Shia, they, are, they do find their lineage back to Persia, back to Iran. Then when you look at Pakistan, again, the, they are very much a uh, uh, Pashtun. There's friends there. Then there was also a certain amount of friendship. Now the the Tajiks, they are anti. Uh, you know, they're they're essentially anti Pakistan. So a lot of them ended up in India. If you think about going north and going closer to the contested area of of Kashmir, Jammu of Pakistan and India. So when you look at a lot of this was spread out and people were essentially moving out of those ways, but that also gave the opportunity for not only Pakistan, but also the U.S. to infiltrate and support a lot of this because there were a lot of movements and something similar to what we saw when the U.S. went in, the Soviets were able to hold big urban areas, you know, big uh, forts, but not able to control the rural region, which is where Al Qaeda came in. You know, these were the individuals that knew how to get things, that knew how to move things through the system. And so they were essentially the logistics arm of the Taliban or the, um, the, 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 the Majus, who were essentially these, I don't want to say warlords, but were individuals who were, um, you know, religious fighters. They were fighting against the, um, the, the extremes of Soviets. So this carried on till 1989, where when they, uh, 1988, where the Soviets signed a deal with Pakistan, Afghanistan, and uh, in the U.S., and they left by 89. So they left by 89, and now this this created a power vacuum, and the power vacuum was between, okay, well, the you had these, uh, these maj- uh, mujads who were essentially now fighting for, for power, and as they're fighting for power, they started committing atrocities. So what did that do? That the, some individuals turned to the, um, uh, the, the strength of the Taliban leader and said, look, you need to come out and you need to help us. And at first people welcomed the Taliban because they were, they were restoring order. They were starting to become more influential. And again, Taliban Pashtuns, now Pakistan sees an opportunity to try to increase their influence within Afghanistan. And that created this this all of a sudden, and not to say Pakistan corrupted, because as the saying goes, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. The Taliban became more and more vicious, which then as they degraded from saving and protecting from 89 onwards, then that created the 91 to 96 civil war of the Northern Alliance, the Tajiks, the Hazars, and Uzbeks against the Taliban. So that continued. And then in 96, there were some loose peace agreement, but essentially everyone just agreed to stay in their own locations. There was continuous fighting outside of areas of Kabul, and then that became a much bigger problem. So now fast forward to 96, from this period on, Al-Qaeda was able to operate. Then you started to see a lot of things get carried out. And what were those things that got carried out? Well, obviously you had 
you know, not, you know, 9-11, which was essentially what brought us to where, why we went in there. But let's go further back. Let's look at the USS Cole, the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. And then what happened after that, you had terrorist attacks in, in obviously Jordan, Kenya, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, Turkey, UK, Israel, Algeria, other areas outside of 9-11, because the Al Qaeda wanted to get the West out of all of Muslim, or I should say, Islamic regions, even if they were welcomed. It had no; it was no matter to them. They wanted them out. So then, that led to the uh, a, a very grave uh, issue in terms of the the destruction of Buddhist uh, temp, uh, Buddhist temple and several statues, and that even brought the ear the the ire of other Muslim nations that are now going against and were going against the Taliban as they continued and Al Qaeda as they continued to to drift into something that was unrecognizable to a lot of the other Muslim nations which then led us to 9-11, which, again, we had warned uh, the uh, uh, Akani when we met with them in Islamabad, uh, Islamis, uh, yeah, in, uh, in, in the Islamabad in uh, Pakistan. And we told them, look, if this happened, we know it wasn't you. We think you have ties to who it was. And we had sent cruise missiles into their compound. But we essentially said, if you do this again, if you turn a blind eye, we're coming for you. And we're going to come for this if something happens. So you can either turn over Os- uh, 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 you know, bin Laden or we're going to come and get him ourselves. And obviously 9-11 happened. And here we are after 20 years of trying to set up a government. So after 20 years, you can see just what had happened where the push was bloodless in some areas. And this is just showing how much the Taliban at this point control after this period. So uh, Ahmad uh, Mossad has now have the Northern Alliance flag is hoisted once again in pa- uh, Pangir, and especially in the valley with U.S. Air Force with the vice president, uh, Sali said on Tuesday, he was in Afghanistan and the legitimate caretaker president after president Ghani has left and he is now in the UAE. So you can see that little pocket of resistance, just north, just essentially Northeast of Kabul, uh, Kabul. And they have supply lines that then also bleed into Pakistan to keep them essentially situated. But when you look at just what has happened in general, we knew we were leaving and, and, you know, whether or not we should have or shouldn't have, you know, there's a completely different show, which is already running long. Let's just look at what happened. We knew we were leaving. We knew that there were individuals that had the right to come out based on the agreements they made and they should have been able to move through. But why did we do what we do, uh, did? Why did we wait to the last minute? You could argue we didn't know there was going to be this collapse, which depending on if you believe the intelligence community or the pol- current political community can be debated. But regardless, people that wanted to leave should have had the ability to leave. Instead, they are now essentially rushing to the Kabul airport. Now, the Kabul airport only has one runway and it's the one that is controlled by the US you know te- technically Turkey controls the whole Kabul airport and with the Taliban now controlling that uh, the the um, the commercial side but we had a military compound in Bagram which could have easily supported a lot of this now given it's much further away from Kabul but there's barracks. It's easier to defend. It's flat. You know, when you look at Kabul, the, the airport's in the middle of the city. You know, if you, urban warfare, ask any military individual, urban warfare is much harder. You're going door to door, floor to floor, room to room to try to clear things out versus a Bagram, which was much easier to defend given its flat, this flat nature. So the 621st uh, Special Force uh, CRW, which is specialized in training and rapidly deplo- deploying, were brought to the airfield just recently in Kabul, and we've started to see some movements of people in, or equipment back to Bagram. So are they going to reopen it? Are we going to see some of this movement? You know, where there is a good chance that we'll be close to about 7,000 U.S. troops in the airport over the coming days as we have some rapid response teams that are sh- that are showing up because we have people who were trapped. And that's one, one of the things in the, 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 six, the 621st Contingency Response Wing 
is brought in to rapidly open some of maybe another airfield or another runway. So then when we look at the Kapool Airport, you get an idea of just what the distance is. So you could say, look, there's a lot of towns going from Kabul to Bagram, which the uh, Taliban could have easily uh, had IEDs. They could have done different things. So there's, there's, it's not a cut and dry. It's not like, look, this is stupid. It should have been here. There's points to be made on, on both. But we left the Bagram Air Base a month ago. Why? If we knew that we may have needed to get people out quickly, we could have said, hey, guys, you can either go here or here, depending on your location and your fallback point. You know, these provinces go here. These provinces go here. There's a way to create order in this chaos. And again, I'm sitting here in the comfort of of the U.S., making these judgments. All of these things are happening. I am not saying that, uh, you know, there was, it just, there was a failure on a lot of levels and we need to understand why they happen so we, they don't happen again. And that could have been said after Vietnam, that could have been said after Iraq, and here we are. So it's about time we sit down and have a hard look at what we are because we are a fantastic military force. Coming in we can take out anything. Our three military branches work seamlessly. But again, an occupying, an occupying force is very difficult if you don't appreciate the tribal nature that which we're in. You can point to the Philippines. You can point to uh, South Korea. You can point to Japan. You know, especially South Korea and Japan, it's a very unified culture. So for us to remain there, it's much easier where this is not the same type of unified culture. There's a lot of cultures within the Afghanistan borders that make things very difficult. But now let's look at Kabul. So this is going to be the difficulty of the safety corridor. Uh, corridor. So eventually, and this is was known as you know Irish Road Two. When you look at the 82nd Airborne was was essentially brought in to s- secure this line. There's mixed reports. Some reports are saying that uh, the the U.S. has advised you know get to the Kabul airport any way you can. We're not coming from you for you. Others are saying that that isn't true. But this gives you an idea of what that road looks like and how many Taliban checkpoints are there as they go door to door trying to find individuals. So let's look at, you know, what are some of these different areas and, and the importance of things. So when you look at the Pangir, this, this, the, essentially this blue line here, this blue, um, uh, uh, you know, province is essentially just north of Kabul. And the idea may have been reestablished there and then pushed south, which if you look at where Bagram was, you're coming, you're essentially going to merge the two, which is going to be something to watch. But when you look at Taba, uh, the Taliban's co-founder, uh, B- uh, Baradar, you know, that's that's the individual that was brought the seen as a savior back, you know, when you think about into eight post eighty nine and then obviously turned into what it was. And he had just landed recently uh, the as of I think two two mornings ago in from Qatar. So when you look at just where things sit and you look at the push that they had coming from, you know, essentially Turkmenistan, from the Iran, not that they originated in those areas, but in terms of the flow through, and then from Pakistan, you can see that it was a very seamless movement where it seemed like it was pre-planned. And that's the question is how much of this was pre-planned, how much of it was, you know, just the the unwillingness of the Afghan military to fight. And when you look at the Afghan military, you have to consider we train them very similar similar to how we train our, our, our own, which is obviously we train them very well. But we also have them rely significantly on air support, air reconnaissance, reconnaissance in general, and and very extensive supply lines that I, I think many don't appreciate just how much logistics comes into maintaining an, a, a military force, maintaining this pressure. And there's a lot of things to be said about, you know, when we stopped running reconnaissance, when we stopped running a lot of these programs, the Afghan military was running blind, you know, they, and when you, when we started polling, and this was even several years ago, Many of them weren't fighting because they believed in the Afghan government. It was more along the lines of believing in their their families, you know, the locations that they were protecting and getting income. So there was a lack of that national fervor that I think people were trying to drum up. And we missed a lot of opportunities along the way and some fantastic uh, geopolitical analysts have highlighted where, again, this has been a misstep across multiple 
uh, administrations. This isn't just Biden's fault or Trump's fault or, or this is everyone's fault. You could say that Biden carries more of the weight because of the way this is being handled. And I 100 percent agree. But there is a lot of failures that can be that span the course of the of this period. So then when we look at, you know, the, the contested areas, so looking at the different maps and, and you can see just, you know, this is the project from FTD. I've, I've retweeted it multiple times. This is where you, you have some areas that are still unconfirmed to be under Taliban control. Some of them ha are, have been, you know, obviously this is a very fluid situation, but you can see that area, that, that Pangea resistance, which still remains. And again, that's something that's going to be watched and is going to be a point of reckoning when, when we look at what comes next. So now let's look at how does the, how do the Taliban finance themselves? So first you have the, uh, the Afghanis central bank. So when we look at it, there were, the reserves were back or, uh, an estimate of about $9 billion. But it doesn't mean that $9 billion was physically in the country. So, and, and this is coming from the, uh, the central bank governor. So as per international standards, most assets are held in safe, liquid assets such as treasuries and gold. So when you look at the breakdown of the assets, so the Federal Reserve, which is obviously us, has $7 billion, the, and, and then they have in U.S. bills and bonds $3.1 billion, and then ramp assets $2.4 billion, Gold, 1.2 billion, and then in the cash account, about 300 million, with international accounts of about 1.3 billion, and about, and then in the BIS, about 700 million. So when you look at this, you know, there's the the, the DAB or or their central bank would take delivery of dollars. So when you look at when the drops were supposed to be, the DAB was set to receive approximately 340 million dollars on August 23rd. But that has since been essentially canceled. So then when you look at, uh, at, you know, given Afghanistan's large current account deficit, they were relying on these dollars getting delivered. And the amount of such cash remaining is close to zero because they hadn't been able to get those physical shipments. Now, when you look at what had been done, so when you look at where things have been held, the uh, the Taliban are, are still on international sanctions list. So all of the assets from the U.S. side, the U.S. has already frozen those assets. So the Taliban have no access to it and can't get physical, do physical dollars to that region. So then when you look at what is happening right now, so the Treasury freezes assets, the Taliban have to implement ca capital controls and limit dollar access, which is going to create currency depreciation, a.k.a. inflation. And then that obviously inflation will rise and then food prices are going to explode. So then... How do you create some means of, of uh, essentially just maintaining activity? And this is when we start turning to the Belt and Road Initiative and some of these deals that China has been working on going through Tajikistan into Afghanistan. And, and when you look at China, China wants ways to get around the Strait of Malacca, Myanmar, the Chinese-Pakistan Economic Corridor, and through Afghanistan. So when you look at Pakistan and, and you look at what the Taliban have done, they were attacking uh, some Chinese assets. And, and China essentially said, look, to the Pakistani government, you need to protect us. And the government was like, look, we don't have the money, nor do we have the personnel. So if you want, you pay for it, and then we'll deploy military assets. So the China obviously didn't like that, that option. And how would it look if they moved the PLA just straight into Pakistan? So they turned around and said, let's make a deal. And they've been paying the Taliban extensively for you know the last, let's call it 18 months conservatively, even though there's been some remnants of attacks and some of these different things. But that is a bigger issue now because now they have a country. Before, they were just paying off and they could you know, extort because when you pay a terrorist, that $10 becomes $100 million, it becomes $100, becomes a $1 million, $10 million. So now they have a means of trade in Afghanistan and the Taliban will need an economy. So now they, instead of just being an extortionist side, they can open up some opportunities because Afghanistan does have raw materials. They do have natural resources. There are ways, and it is a way for, uh, for China to access Iran and some other ways to get around the Strait of Malacca. Now, given Afghanistan is an isolated country, but 
it provides opportunities to to get away and to avoid you know the restrictions of the Strait of Malacca. And then this is coming from things that have currently happened. So Foreign Minister Wang Yi met with the Taliban second in command uh, Baradar in Tin, in Tianjin two weeks ago. So. He boasted that the Taliban could return to Kabul and regain power in 20 to 30 days. And, you know, this was obviously two weeks ago, and here we are, and they're sitting in Kabul. So with the U.S. withdrawal and the collapse of secular government of President Ghani, now complete, Beijing is wasting no time in trying to move into and creating a new partner. So let's understand the different bar- backdrops. So the Taliban agreed uh, with China to become part of the Belt and Road Initiative, excuse me, once the Taliban uh, regained control. But it was also clear that the Taliban had to stop helping the East Turkestan Islamic movement, which when you look at where things are, it goes into Xinjiang, the Uzbeks, and Tajikistan in terms of the Muslim movement. So they'd have to stop helping. In return, they'd become part of the BRI, get loans, and start building this equipment. So Beijing has also, in return, because... What is this but a fantastic marketing opportunity for China? They can turn around and say, oh, Taiwan, look, these are your saviors. These are the people that you're going to protect. These are the people that are going to come and back you. And since that point, they, uh, uh, Beijing or you know, China have run uh, several, uh, you know, essentially d- d- uh, defense identification zones. They've, they've run several moves into them, again, uh, showing some of that stress. Now, you can take a step back and say, look, the, the U.S. did this greater good situation where they're focusing more on other areas, whether it be launching from, you know, protecting Taiwan, taking some of these assets. But there was it didn't take much to create a certain amount of stability within Afghanistan. And at the same time, it also provided a launching point into China. If you think of ways to cordon off China. Now, the only thing we can rely on is our positioning in South Korea, in Taiwan, the Philippines, and in India. And, and maybe there's a strategic reason of, you know, it doesn't make sense to go into the west of China, fly over the deserts of China to, to strike, you know, supply lines. Maybe they're saying it's going to take more or the bigger focus is going to be through India and above. But again, these are now fortified areas. And the the area between Afghanistan and China, given you're going through Taj, uh, Tajikistan, but they're at odds, the, Tajikistan is at odds with China. So th- there are ways where we could have gone in there and, and done some damage. But again, these are things that we have to consider as the data and everything continues to mold and change. So then when we look at what is in Afghanistan. Well, we know that they have a lot of lithium. We know they have cobalt. They, we know they have gold, mold of beans, and obviously there's a lot of opium. And the Taliban have said that opium is going to be cut down. They're not going to be part of that trade anymore. So China is also quick to want to come into this. And, and again, getting away from the, from the straits. So there's the copper mine just outside of Kabul. There's iron deposits. And remember, the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, is creating that vertical capacity. So they wanted that vertical integration and raw materials that can then be moved directly back into China is a, obviously has a lot of appeal. But when you look at where things are, there's also this little thing called the Himalayas mountain range, which you have to contend with. So there's going to have to be ways to get around that, which again is going to make things a bit difficult, but you can see just what the motivation can be and how that can be important for what China's end goals are. But when we also look at some of the areas and, and as we talk about inflation and as we talk about things coming up, you know, this is just looking at, and this is again from 2019 on extreme water issues, you know, look at Pakistan at, at 14. You know, you, you look at you look at um, the UAE at number 10. You look at all of these areas that are continuing to struggle, and it's water scarcity. You know, Afghanistan it now, while not being in the top, is now in the top. And so when you look at this area and how tight they are in water, and then we think back to the inflation side because they're not going to be able to get dollars. The economy is going to get impacted. That's going to make not only the food problem issue bigger, but also water scarcity. You know, what is what, what's going to happen? How is that going to be managed as this has continued to worsen 
and we continue to see a lot of these pitfalls. So there's a lot of moving pieces. Obviously, this is a very fluid uh, backdrop, you know, trying to give as much information as possible in a succinct way to look at what comes next. And, and I think, uh, you know, a quick summary is the Taliban right now have this charm profile. They're trying to push things through. You know, what form of Sharia law is still yet to be seen? You know, we've seen women that have been scared to go out into the open. They have already gotten rid of uh, female-based advertising. You know, you're, they, they've arrested the, um, the, uh, the only female uh, mayor. So you're starting to see some of that creep of the older time, but will they avoid the Al-Qaeda? Because they could look at this and say, look, we, we brought the anger of, of the U.S. because we let Al-Qaeda in here. We're not going to do that again. I find that unlikely, but again, you're, you're seeing some of that, what are the things that they're saying? They're also talking about opium. They're going to get rid of the, um, the poppy uh, uh, crop. That's going to cut, you know, that should cut heroin into the U.S. Like they're, they're saying some of the right things and they're trying to say, but people are still been wary to recognize them. You know, even Pakistan has been said, look, good job. We're going to wait, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll consider what this is going to look like. We'll, we'll talk to our partners and see if this makes sense as the, you know, the Taliban is still on, you know, Russia has been quick to say and, and start having conversations with not only just Iran, but the other stands that, that look to Russia for, um, uh, for support and for, uh, you know, let's just say direction. And Russia still has the Taliban on their, on their, um, t- terrorism list. So, we're going to have to see how this progresses because obviously this is fluid and as all geopolitical situations are. So if you have any questions, please let me know. You know, I, we're, we're trying to gather as much information as possible. You know, I've, I've worked with a lot of individuals that, uh, that have, you know, in terms of doing logistics runs, you know, military uh, per- personnel. So, and if you're having a hard time dealing with this, please talk to someone. You know, the last thing we need is, um, is this to, to bring out any PTSD or suicidal thoughts, you know, please just seek help if, if you feel so, or just talk to someone if needed. Uh, so now that's the end of our, uh, you know, our, our, you know, let's just say deep dive into, into Afghanistan. And now we're going to go into the econ show and go, you know, much deeper into what is happening with food and what is happening with the U S economy, global economy, and how this kind of intertwines with a lot of things that are happening in today's world.